Um, I guess first and foremost, we've uh, got a lot to cover tonight. Um, uh, hopefully I'll get you out of here in an hour and a half. If you find that as the evening goes on and if you have to leave early, please feel free to do so. Uh, because we have a lot to cover, um, I generally like to tell the people to put your seat back in the upright position, put your tray tables away, put your seat belts on, and hold on. Is there going to be a test? Yes, for oh. you. Oh my god. Uh, is, that, take is it an exit exam like we can't leave until, or I can't leave? <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> One of the uh, inherent problems or concerns when doing a talk such as this on the scriptures is that we have people here who come who have various backgrounds in the scriptures. Some who have studied the scriptures for a length of time and are somewhat familiar with how the Catholic tradition approaches Bible interpretation to people who have had absolutely none. Um, and so therefore, when you're delving into scriptures, you always run the risk of saying something that upsets people or leaves them a bit unsettled and so forth. Um, and should that happen tonight, it's Father Mike's um, issue because he's the one that asked me to do it. <laughs> Hey, I don't want to be playing cleanup here. <laughs> um, so, to, so hopefully to alleviate that to some degree, um, I'm going to be taking a little bit of time in the very beginning just to put this whole talk in context. And that's what scripture study is all about, is putting the subject matter in its original context so we know and can come to understand what the author meant to infer to the original people he was writing to. And so we will do that. I will um, give just a brief explanation of uh, biblical interpretation as far as the Catholic Church is concerned in the hopes that we can then take the infancy narratives, which are the birth narratives found in the Gospels, in, Ma in Matthew and Luke, not found in John and Mark, and hopefully it will um, give us uh, a little bit of a foundation in order to um, give us a better understanding of what the sacred authors were trying to do when they compiled these very beautiful, beautiful narratives. Um, so, we got an hour and a half. <clears throat> I've taken courses, tons of them, over the years to try to cover all the subject matter we're going to cover in an hour and a half. So obviously, can't do it. Um, there's going to leave, you will leave here tonight, I guarantee, with more questions than answers, probably more confused than enlightened, but we will certainly all have a good time. Will we leave here with a headache? <laughs> Only if you have too much wine. You <laughs> yes, and I, I just ask you please don't tar and feather me at the end of this talk, and hopefully I will have a job come tomorrow morning. Yes, you will. So again, um, you may encounter things said here tonight that may be new, as I said, and a little different from what we were brought up with in, in our tradition. Um, so I would hope that this talk would spur you on maybe to more study later on. Um, hopefully we can do more um, Bible stuff as time goes by. Um, and this may be just a taste this evening um, of, of what lays a, lays a store for the future. The other thing in the many, many years I've been doing this that I have learned, the lesson I've learned very quickly and very early on is you do not say nothing at all as far as the scriptures are concerned until you first of all ground it in church doctrine. Um, I don't want you leaving here saying, well, what we heard tonight was Deacon Lee's uh, opinion. You won't hear my opinion. Um, what you're going to hear tonight um, as far as conclusions or, or such, um, um, uh, conclusions of stuff being made are going to be representative of what the majority of Catholic scholars and so forth um, say today. So it's not going to be me that, um, that you're going to be hearing from. Um, and it's important to ground all of this stuff in church doctrine. I mean, that's, um, we teach uh, by way of the authority of the church. 
the magisterium of the church is the teaching arm of the church that has the ultimate say on scripture interpretation, uh, which is informed by biblical studies and biblical scholars and so forth, but we always defer to the magisterium of the church. Um, is there any correct one way to read the Bible? No. There's many ways. There are some more preferred than the others, and there are some ways that uh, uh, <clears throat> that are endorsed by the Catholic Church, and there's others that are not. So I will give you tonight kind of uh, an overview of one particular form of um, interpretation. It is a form of interpretation that, uh, again, not only the Church endorses, but is also used by many of the mainline Protestant churches today. And as a result, you can go to a, a Boston College or any of those big universities and have sit in on a scripture course of interpretation, and you would have all these other different faith traditions there. So it wouldn't be just Catholic or whatever. Which is great, because then when you've got all the different traditions approaching the scripture interpretation using the same tools, what does it promote? It promotes unity instead of division and, and so forth. Um, as a result of that, um, of our common approach to, to scripture interpretation, we are now within a hair's breadth away of reunification um, with the Lutheran Church. Many of the things that divided us in the past now have been able to be resolved because we look at scriptures the same way. And uh, Pope Francis just had a meeting um, with the Lutheran Church, and there are still some issues with the Pope, <laughs> even one. Um, that divides us. Well, things are like Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, uh, faith alone, scripture alone, things like that which used to divide us now, we resolve. So, you know the scripture interpretation that you're using is correct if it promotes unity. If it promotes division, anxiety, hatred, and you know you're probably in the wrong place. I don't know if any <clears throat> of you have ever been to a Bible study that, um, and I've been to many in my younger years, where I left, and it's not here at St. Mark's, this was elsewhere, where I left with a headache and so mad because the whole time people spent arguing over in the interpretation of a passage. Mm -hmm. And who usually won? person with the biggest mouth, the loudest voice, and you know, and you come out of there saying, I don't know what I learned, I don't know what the Bible passage was all about, and who's to say this person had the right answer? And so there's a reason that that happens, and that's what the church, uh, the method that I will look at here tonight helps address. Okay. What version of the Bible did you develop? to the five members? The New American. The New American. Which is the version, the translation um, that our readings are taken from from Mass. Okay. Yeah. The New American Bible is, is, and there's many translations out there mm -hmm. for various reasons, but that's the one the church okay. in Mass is taken from. Yeah. Okay, so, um, first then we're going to take a look um, just at, as you may well imagine, there are many documents on Scripture. Many, 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 many. Um, I've chosen two passages out of two particular documents that I would like to just share with you this evening and then flesh these out just a little bit before we start launching off into, into other things. The, the two um, documents that have um, probably the greatest impact on biblical scripture studies is called Divino Afante Spiritu, which was um, promulgated in 1943. That's um, inspired by the divine spirit. And the other one is called the Verbal, which is literally means word of God. And basically they say this, for the correct understanding of what the sacred author wanted to assert, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic styles of perceiving, speaking, and writing, which prevailed at the time of the sacred writer and to customs people normally followed at that period in their everyday dealings with one another. The interpreter must, as it were, go back wholly in spirit to those remote centuries of the East with the aid of all the available sciences and accurately determine what meaning the sacred writer really intended. So what is the church encouraging us to do? 
the church is encouraging us to use all the means available to us, all the available sciences from psychology to archaeology, you name it, to help us to better understand the culture and the time that the sacred authors wrote in so that we can gain a better understanding of what the sacred author intended the meaning of their passage to be for the people they were writing to. This should be no surprise. They were not writing to you. And they weren't writing to me. As a matter of fact, the sacred authors would roll over in their graves if they knew we were still studying their word 2,500 years or 2,000 years later. So, the reason the church, uh, <clears throat> again, encourages us to do that is because once we discern what the sacred author was trying to convey to his readers, then once we get that meaning, we can then extract that. To give you a 10 cent word for today, we can exegete that. We can exit it out of the text and then take that meaning and apply it to each one of our lives in a way that helps enrich us, strengthens our faith, and helps us to grow in our Christian walk with Jesus. That's a very different approach to Scripture than one where someone simply picks up the Bible, opens it up, and says, hmm, I think that this is what the author wants to say. And then someone else is saying something, well, I think this is what it says. Well, then he said, well, I think this is what it says. And then what do they end up doing? arguing all, all night long as to what the meaning was. No one really knows, and as I said, usually you come out of there with a headache and the person with the loudest voice wins the battle. That kind of biblical interpretation, which is used mostly by people who approach reading the scriptures literally, or what we would call a fundamentalist approach, are people who read into a text what they want it to say, as opposed to exegeting from the text what the sacred author intended to say. One's called exegesis, the other is called eisegesis. First question on your quiz for today. <laughs> Still, Can you say that one more time? i got to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to have to give you a time out tonight. <laughs> I wanted the night off. Thank you so much. <laughs> so that's our task, is to exegete a text, to try to find out what the sacred author intended to say. Well, how do you do that? How do we, as everyday Catholics, do that? Well, we are lucky that the church has done a lot of that for us, and they've done that through writing of commentaries on all of the different scriptures. And so when we pick up a commentary, which is... Um, <clears throat> endorsed by the church, we can be assured that that's the type of approach that they've used in coming up with the interpretations that they have. Um, so, um, yeah, where was I going with that? Um, so, from from the standpoint of biblical interpretations, we oh yeah, how do we do that? Um, as I said, the church has mostly done that for us, but they use five tools that we are all very familiar with, that we all learned probably fifth grade. They apply to the scripture text five tools. They ask who, what, when, where, why. It's simple. You say, well, how can that be helpful? Um, who wrote the scriptures? Well, of course, many different authors, but let's, let's take the, uh, what we're looking at tonight, the Gospels. Who wrote the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Mark, and John. Matthew, Mark, the people who wrote, the people who drink in the wine. Who wrote, who wrote the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Wrong. Holy Spirit. Wrong. Sort of. Many people. We don't know. We don't know. They were they are written anonymously. You say, well, geez, you know why? Well, with a. a Christianity being a persecuted religion, uh, a movement, Jesus movement in its early years, to attach your name to something like that, how do you think, and it got into the hands of the Romans or the Jewish authorities, what do you think your fate would be? Only a fool would put their name to something like that. 
um, the names that we have attached to them were much later editions. And they were, they were placed on the text at the time because these were biblical figures of importance that came down to the sacred authors over the years and they lended a certain authenticity to the writings. Did, but were they written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. Do we know who they were? No. Do we have the original Gospels? No. Now, you say, well, why is that important? Well, here's why. If we were to attach those names as the actual authors, then a claim could be made, and has been made by some, that, well, Matthew and John were apostles. So if there's any discrepancies in the Gospels, we're going to take Matthew and John over Mark and Luke, because they weren't apostles. And that would be a very dangerous assumption to make. So asking a very simple question like who breaks open this whole thing on authority and interplay between the different Gospels and helps us to situate the Gospels in, in, in a way that we approach all with equal value and equal authenticity and that the names have no bearing whatsoever. So that's how the historical contextual approach is applied to Scripture. You know, where it was written. Where were the Gospels written? Would you be surprised to find out that none of them were written in Israel? Only one was written by a Jew. The rest were all written by Gentiles. Two Gentiles. You say, okay, so why is that important? Well, maybe the fact that in um, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you look at some of the, in, in, within the context of the Gospel, and we find traditions in there which misrepresent the Jewish faith or Jewish traditions. Why? Well, because they're written by Gentiles, who people who aren't that familiar with the Jewish tradition. A classic, huh? the Passion story. Who's placed beside Jesus as Pilate trans you know, trumps out these two guys? They got Jesus and they got someone else and said, okay, Jewish tradition says that one of these guys on Passover can be let go. Who is that one? Barabbas. Yeah. Yes, what? No tradition exists. No. Never has. Never will. So then we have to start asking ourselves then, well, why? Why is that seen in there? And how did it come about? So those, kind, those are the kind of questions that the historical contextual approach helps us to de delve into. By asking those very simple questions, we can gain and glean an awful lot of um, information about gospel and gospel development. Now, also, um, let me make sure I cover all my bases. And please feel free to jump in with any question. No question is too silly. I guarantee some of the answers may be. I have a question. Is there, do you think there's only one author per gospel? There is. John's style is. John's, the John's gospel, because it's so vastly different. Matter of fact, most of the scholars um, would concur that it, it's a school. It came out of a school of um, scholars that composed the Gospel of John. Gospel of John is the most highly Greek style gospel that we have. <coughs> And um, so it more than likely was not just one person. That was written a long time afterwards, too, right? Excuse me? Wasn't John's written? <clears throat> the Gospels were written, <clears throat> the first Gospel written is the Gospel of what? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Matthew. Excuse me? Matthew. Mark. 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 Mark is the first. Matthew, Luke, Luke Acts. The author of Luke is also the author of Acts. It's a two volume series and then the Gospel of John. Gospel of Mark, written somewhere around 70 A.D. Why is that important to know? Well, around 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed by the Romans in Israel. Had a tremendous impact on the writing of the Gospel of Mark. Why? Where was it written? The Gospel of Mark was written in Rome. So here's this persecuted Jewish sect still residing in Rome who is now destroying the Jewish temple in Israel. Can you imagine how fearful they must have been? So it had a tremendous impact on their writings. 
So again, asking these very uh, essential questions are very, very important. Um, the structure, the writing of the Gospels too, um, I think is important for us to know. Gospel of Mark was written first. Gospels are not, and I can't say this strongly enough, are not biographies of Jesus Christ. Not in the sense that we understand the biography. You pick up the biography of some famous person, usually starts with the birth, goes through all their life, and ends with death. Um, the Gospel's main purpose for writing was to convey the author's theological understanding and underpinning for their faith that they believed in, which was that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. That's their sole purpose for writing, is to convey in theological terms that very profound belief. In doing that, they may use biographical information, if it's available. They will use historical information, if it's available. They will use myths, if it's available and appropriate. They will construct certain things, if it sues their purpose of conveying these theological truths. So what we have to be very, very careful of when we're looking at the scriptures is that we don't reduce them to a biography or a historical uh, rendition or anything of that nature. They are a composition of many different styles of writing, of which we will look at tonight when we look at the infancy narratives. And all of those different styles of writing are used by the sacred authors in order <clears throat> to get across their theological perspective of Jesus. The theology of Jesus in Matthew is very different from the theology of Jesus in Mark, which is very different from Luke, which is extremely different from John. No one gospel tells you or gives you the entire picture of who Jesus Christ is. You have to take all four together to get a more accurate view of who Jesus was and who he was to the early Christian community. No one passage gives you all of that. Now, let me make another very important distinction that we as Catholics make that those who approach scriptures from a literal standpoint or from a fundamentalist standpoint do not make. And this is crucial for, for Catholics. Catholics believe that the entire Bible is the inspired Word of God. But not everything in the Bible is a divinely revealed truth. Divine inspiration does not equal, <clears throat> divine revelation does not equal divine inspiration. In other words, if the authors had a theological point that they wanted to make, they would feel free as we just read in these documents, to use everything available to them at the time, their knowledge, their, their type of literatures that were available to them, all the different tools of writing, they would feel free to compose a story in order to use that story to make a theological point. They would use culturally conditioned stories to convey theological <coughs> truths. These stories are inspired by God, but they are stories, nonetheless, used as vehicles for conveying divine truths. If I took each one of you and said, okay, the moral of the story is, thou shalt not steal. And I asked you to compose a story to teach that moral precept to a child, all of you could do that. I guarantee you, if I sat and I compared everybody's story, it would be very different. Because each of you would make up your story from your own life experiences. Huh? So you would bring to bear on that topic all that you know and that you have learned in your life over time, and then you would compose the story in order to convey that reality. But if I took that truth, it would be the same for all of you. So do you see what I'm saying? The, the storyline becomes the culturally 
inspired storyline used to convey a religious truth. The religious truth is true for eternity. The inspired storyline used to convey that truth can change over time and does. I'll give you a, an example. Book of Genesis. What's the book of Genesis all about? Creation. creation. <clears throat> Do you know there's four different, entirely different accounts of creation in the Bible? Four. I did. And usually what we hear is a harmonization of those accounts. For instance, the first chapter in the book of Genesis is all about the story of creation in six days. Seventh day, God rests, huh? The second and third chapters is a completely different account of creation actually written 400 years earlier than chapter 1, but in that chapter, those chapters, we have Adam and Eve, tree of knowledge, all of the serpent, and you've got both of these stories side by side in the scriptures, and so you say to yourself, well, why the, didn't the editors either harmonize them or pick one over the other? Because the story isn't what matters. Both of them teach theological truths. God is one. God is everything. God is the uh, creator. Everything he made is good. Human beings are very good. We are made in the, in the likeness and image of God. Male and female equal in the sight of God. Humanity has been given dominion over creation, a responsibility to care for it. Those theological truths are in chapter 1. Those theological truths are in chapter 2, but two very different stories at how creation came about because they were written at very different times, very different cultures, 400 years apart. Today, we're going to write a story of creation. Big Bang. Expanding universe. Supernovas. Evolution. That's our context today. Divine truths. God's behind it all. Everything God made is good. Humanity made in the image and likeness is, is very good. Human beings still have dominion over the, over the earth, have a responsibility to treat it with care. Has that changed? No. So our inspired storyline is just as inspired as the inspired stories of the scriptures. The theological truths, though, are true for eternity. So therein lies the crux. When we look at a scripture passage, we then, or commentators of biblical exegetes, have to extract from those stories the theological truths, the divine truths which we have to hold on to, and separate that out from the inspired storyline. Now, this is when we get into problems. What happens if you say then the inspired storyline is the divine truth? <laughs> Then you've got creationists today who look say, hey, it says right here in the Bible, the earth was made in, in six years, in six days. So the earth is only 6,000 years old. And yet we have archaeology evidence to prove to the contrary. That's why we have to be very careful not to elevate the inspired storyline to the level of divine truths. That's the point I'm trying to make. And that will be evident tonight when we look at the infancy narratives. So the infancy narratives, one then could jump ahead and say, okay, are we talking about that same scenario with the infancy narratives? Yeah, we yeah. are. There's a divine, there is an inspired storyline now. How do we know? The infancy narrative of Matthew and the infancy narrative of Luke, very different. They have some similarities. What are the similarities? The divinely revealed truths. But the inspirational storyline of each is different. And therefore, when people said there's no contradictions in the Bible, yes, there is. It's a problem. You will not find any contradictions in the divine truths that it conveys. You will only find contradictions in the inspirational storylines that are used to convey those truths because those change and vary over time.
Making any sense? Yeah. 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 Good stuff. How am I doing? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> theology. Theology uh, uh, the other thing about the about the gospel construction, um, just to keep that in mind, the the gospel of Mark is our first. The gospel of Mark has no infancy narratives. And everyone does know what I mean by infancy narratives. Sometimes I make assumptions and I shouldn't. The birth stories of Jesus. So why doesn't it? Why? None in John either. And I think John pushes it back to pre-existent word. So we have Mark. The first gospel written, it has no birth narratives. And guess what? It has no resurrection either. And that was a big problem for the early church. Big problem. The Gospel of Mark ended with the empty tomb. And that just left you. Which I think is far more profound than the resurrection stories added on. And, and, that, and chapter 16 was added on later because the early church struggled so much with the fact that it... Because our faith is based around the resurrection. But, so, that was the first Gospel written written around 70 A.D. Matthew and Luke were written between 80 and 90 A.D. When Matthew and Matthew and Luke wrote, they had some copy of Mark in front of them. Why do we know this? Because Matthew and Luke share 630 verses of Mark. So that, you know, you can read and say, geez, didn't I just read that over here? But it was a little bit different here. So they, they used Mark to, he, to compose their Gospels. Oftentimes, uh, you've, you've heard the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke is referred to as synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means like seeing with one eye. They, they both saw, um, they both used Mark, and so they, they used a, a lot of his verses to, in different theological ways to get their theology across. But the interesting part is, there was no infancy narratives in Mark. They didn't come till later. Well, why? It's 21st century Christians, we want to know, you know, right from day one. Um, not important to the early church, was it? It was more important that the church teached and preached the resurrection of Jesus because that's the central tenet of our faith. The birth of Jesus is not a central tenet of our faith. It's the resurrection. If there's no the resurrection, we can go to the local bar and get the good stuff to drink. Tonight, you know? So the resurrection is what brought people to faith. But people being people, they get curious. And so as time went on, as we started teaching them more about Jesus and so forth, and they saying, well, if he really is who we think he is, and, and so forth, then they started to ask the questions. They started to push the questions back. Well, where did he come from? Thank you. What about his early years? Well, let's go further back. What about his birth? How did that happen? And so those questions came later. And therefore their insertion in the Gospels came later. It was not something the early church or the, the early Jesus movement was concerned about. It, 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 only, it only came later. So, then we look, we look at, um, we, we'll jump now into looking at some of the infancy narratives. Questions or thoughts or? It's all clear as mud. I can see it on your faces. Particularly, um, you're focusing primarily tonight on the Gospels, but the, the um, instructions, if you want, the way that we're supposed to approach reading scripture, is that the same for all books of the Bible? Mm -hmm. That we should approach it in that same sort Correct. of way? Mm -hmm. And isn't there some truth to, you know, if you don't have theological academic background to understand all this, when we lay people read scripture and it, we feel inspired or we can identify with doesn't take away from the, the context in which the story was written in. Right. No, 
Right, and you know, if you pray like let's say you're a and so forth, or some people, um, you know, they, you know, they're reading the scripture and a certain word, well, the Pope, uh, they asked him, um, this was just a couple of weeks ago, how do you prepare a homily? And I loved it because it's, because I do it almost the same way. Um, it kind of validated. But one of the things he said is he will read it and reading out loud, if something, if a passage or, or a word of that scripture jumps out at him, then you know he feels that that's a movement of the Holy Spirit, and he'll focus on that and, and kind of go from there. So there is that, yes. But it has to be couched in the fact that we have to make sure that we don't assume then that that is the only correct understanding and that um, again it when we sit down as Catholics to study the scriptures we probably should have a good commentary with us that would help us to understand what we're reading well it certainly explains why it's not easy to explain scripture to a non-believer mm -hmm. or to somebody who perhaps has left the church or somebody who is struggling to understand why we believe what we do and in all sincerity I have to believe that many of us have tried to share with people you know our experience as far as scripture or our right. interpretations but it often does end up in arguments it often does end up in a defensive stance because we read it one way and the other person just doesn't I had this I had uh, two women come to my house and I was feeling particularly mysterious one day. And, uh, so they said, can we come in and share scripture with you? I said, absolutely, come on in. So I had them back three times. And they were so enthralled with what I was presenting them, I really had them hooked. And then the fourth time, their bishop or whoever it was, I got a nice note from him thanking him very much for it my time and efforts, but they will not be back. <laughs> so, yeah. And Deacon Lee, like, my, my sister got kind of hooked on the Bible through the Psalms, because, yeah, you can read the Psalms, and it, it draws you, and it, it relates to, to our lives and, and things like that, and it can be, it's a, a beautiful way to pray. And, of course, that's what the whole Liturgy of the Hours thing is, is praying with the Psalms. And then you can move towards seeing people that use scriptures, and will just take a verse and use it as a weapon. Oh, you know, and uh, and then that, again, that's where division comes from, and where hatred and all sorts of things. And it's it's fascinating how you can go from something that is so peaceful and can bring us so much strength to to tearing us apart at the same time. So it's Most one book. Powerful book in the world. Yeah, it has saved more people than you can imagine. It has been the cause of the death of millions of people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, and he quotes John 8, well, most of John uh, chapter 8, but specifically the verse where Jesus is cast in the light of condemning the Jews as being sons of the devil. And he used that as a tool to say, see, this gives me the right to do to the Jews what I'm doing because God said it, it's here in black and white. See how dangerous it can be when we don't apply the five W's when we just take it point blank. Now, is there stuff in there that we can take literally? Thou shalt not kill. Not much we can do with that other than, you know. So, yes, very, very powerful. Okay, I'd like to um, just share with you and make sure I've got all my bases covered here because I know, please feel free to get up and quarter of eight already. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, like I said, awful lot. So buckle your seat belts. Um, let me just share with this with you, uh, uh, just these few paragraphs and then we'll, we'll break it open. The infancy narratives are literary vehicles, we talked about this, constructed by the evangelists to promote their particular theology or, and, Christo and Christology. So in other words, the infancy narrative that we'll look in Matthew has a theological construction to it. Has Matthew's theological construction um, in a way that it presents Jesus in the light he wants to present. Luke's is very different. And I'll, I'll share that with you. But it says, 
um, as a prologue to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they are constructed in such a way that they give the reader a, sna a snapshot of the evangelist's understanding of whom Jesus is. An understanding that is to be fleshed out, excuse the pun, in the rest of the Gospel. Fleshed out. God made man the incarnation. <laughs> Give him some more wine. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't get it. <laughs> oh, no. uh, all right, so that falls flat on the I don't think our comedy tour is going to go anywhere. I think we're, we're stuck here. <laughs> um, it is precisely this role as a theological snapshot that have led some scholars to believe and this is important, that the infancy narratives were constructed well after the Gospels were written in response to the question now being asked about Jesus' birth. So where do scholars come down today? Were, the, were the, the infancy narratives written first, then the Gospels followed, or vice versa? I would say more scholars, it would fall more on the side of scholars thinking that the, the infancy narratives came first but it'd be like 51 to 49 percent. That there's probably just as good a chance that they were, the whole Gospel of Matthew was written, and then later on the infancy narrative was attached to it. And, and if you take and look at the infancy narrative and study it just in and of itself, you can get a pretty darn good understanding of what's going to come later on in the Gospel of Matthew, his understanding of who Jesus is. So it's a 50-50 thing. So it's only when we understand that the infancy narratives are primarily theological treaties that, can, that we can reconcile the two very different and oftentimes con contradictory accounts found in Matthew and Luke. For instance, in Matthew's Gospel, the infancy narrative of Matthew forms, forms the prologue of the Gospel. It consists of a genealogy, and we can look at that in a minute, and then five stories. The birth of Jesus, the visit of the Magi, the flight, of the e uh, flight from Egypt, the massacre of the infants, and the return from Egypt. <coughs> Why is that important? Matthew's Gospel is the only Gospel that is written by a Jew to Jews. So it's extremely important for this Jew to situate Jesus firmly within the Jewish tradition of the expected Messiah. And the first thing Matthew does is he, he lines Jesus up by the use of a genealogy. Matthew traces the genealogy of Jesus, which is fascinating, because they didn't do this kind of stuff, so how he did it, no one really knows. But what he did do is he situated Jesus in the Davidic, line um, from Abraham down to the time of Jesus. And the use of the genealogy, or he uses that genealogy to place Jesus firmly within that context so that he can make the case that this Jesus is the long expected Jewish Messiah. Now I say Jewish Messiah. Matthew's understanding of Jesus is that he is the Messiah for the Jews. Luke's understanding is not that whatsoever. Luke broadens it. Luke's understanding of Jesus is that he is the Messiah of the world, the universal Messiah. Luke takes a genealogy and he says, he has no use for Matthew's purpose of it, so what does Luke do? He has Jesus' birth go all the way back to Adam, given the universal aspect of his understanding of the role of Jesus as the Messiah of God. So both of these authors use a genealogy in a way that best represents their theological understanding of the important role that Jesus has to play in the life of, of people. Okay? So, the other aspect of, Ju of Jesus for Matthew is this. Who is the great lawgiver in the Jewish faith? Moses. Moses. He preeminent. For most of the Jews in the first parts of their early history, they would not read anything but the Pentateuch. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, mm -hmm. Deuteronomy, Numbers and Deuteronomy. That was their Bible. And they were of the 
assumption that Moses wrote all five. Moses didn't write any of them, but that was the tradition at the time. And so if Moses is the great lawgiver, then what is Jesus? Jesus is now um, the law incarnate. Moses come down off the hill to give the Ten Commandments. Jesus comes down off the mountain, gives the Beatitudes. Jesus now is the law in flesh. Jesus is the new Moses. Now, the Jewish people can understand that connection very well. For Luke to write that to Gentiles, they would be going, uh, you know, they had no clue. And so that whole motif of Jesus as the new Moses, as the law incarnate, the wisdom of God now incarnate, wouldn't play with Gentiles. So Luke's theology is something very, very different. So we started with the genealogy and with those five stories. Why five stories? Because they believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So it's representative of that understanding that most Jewish people would have. So using literary devices here for them to sit and read and start to make connections back to their heritage. Because he has to firmly put Jesus within that, that heritage. Um, as I said, Jesus is portrayed in this gospel as the new Moses who relives the Exodus experiences and Moses' persecution. Okay, <clears throat> in Matthew's gospel, there is a tradition that both Luke and Matthew have to deal with. The traditions are this, that Jesus was reared in Nazareth was born in Bethlehem. Well, Matthew and Luke do two very different things with this. With Luke. Luke takes those known facts and says, okay, I've got the Holy Family here in Nazareth. Tradition says Jesus was born in Bethlehem. i got to get Jesus to Bethlehem. i got to get the Holy Family there. <laughs> Somehow. What does he do? See, how does he get the Holy Family to move? The census. Yeah. Except there's only one problem. It was never a census. The census that, if you look back to that time, the census was probably three or four years after the birth of Jesus. But Luke, he's a Gentile. He doesn't know. He knew that there was something along that time. It fits his, his story, and so he moves him. So in Luke's gospel, Jesus, the Holy Family, lives in Nazareth. He invokes uh, the, the census. He gets them to Bethlehem. And what happens after Bethlehem? They go home. They go home. They go home. They go back. Yeah, the end. <laughs> However, Matthew does something very different. Of course, then with Luke, they, they're traveling. And what do we have? We have the story of the manger. No room in the end. We have all of that. Remember what I said earlier about storylines. We have a storyline being put together here. <clears throat> Not to convey a historical truth, but to convey a religious reality. And so, we've got, we've got the manger, we've got no room at the end, we've got all of that. And so, in, in Luke's Gospel, he gets them there, and then they simply go home. Problem solved, he got them, he got them born in Bethlehem, he's got them back being reared in Nazareth. Matthew, on the other hand, does something very different. With Matthew, there's no inn, there's no manger, there's none of that. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is born in his house. The Holy Family lives there in Bethlehem. Okay? And again, in the first two chapters, if you read that, that becomes clear. But Matthew's got the opposite problem. Okay. You know, no problem here. I got him living in Bethlehem. We got him born in Bethlehem. But I got to get him back to Nazareth because that's where tradition says he was reared. How do I do that? Well, again, Keep in mind the theology of Matthew. Matthew's Jesus is the new Moses, the, the great lawgiver, 
the person who brings people out of exile of Egypt and saves his people by bringing them to the promised land. That's Moses, huh? What does Jesus do? In a dream to Joseph? We got the persecution of the innocents, which you find in Matthew, but you don't find in Luke. Luke has no purpose for it. Um, only Matthew has it. Why? Because Matthew has to get Jesus out of, Beth out of Bethlehem. He does it through the massacre of the, in of the innocent, which is reminiscent of an Old Testament text that, again, Jewish people would be very familiar with. They could make the connection back in the tradition of the original massacre that happened that happened at Passover in Egypt. And so, he said, okay. He's got Herod presented as this tyrant who wants to kill Jesus. So Joseph gets a dream, boots Jesus out of Bethlehem, sends him to Egypt. Then when Herod dry, dies, and an angel goes back to Joseph and said, okay, those who wanted the life of the child are now dead. You're free to take him back. Where does he take him? Yeah, so he's solved this problem. He got Jesus out of Bethlehem, back to Nazareth, but he's done a very important thing. He's made, he's tied Jesus to Moses. Because Jesus coming, what's he do? Jesus comes out of Egypt. He comes out as Savior. Moses saves the Israelites. Jesus saves all of Israel, saves everyone. And so the whole Exodus theme is replayed again in Matthew. So he's constructed his infancy narrative in such a way that reflects this whole perspective of Jesus as this new Moses, this great lawgiver who now saves his people, such as Moses did in the early time. And he did that because he was writing to Jews who can make that connection. Luke has no need of any of that. Luke is more universal in nature. So when Jesus is born in Luke's Gospel, the choirs of angels and the whole world erupts in joyful jubilation because this Messiah is the universal Messiah, not just the Messiah of the Jews. He's everybody's Messiah, which gives the Gentiles great hope because they're not Jews. Okay? All right, so how many need a drink? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> so the, the basic message of Luke's infancy narratives then is contained in the angel's announcement for today the city of David the Savior has been born for you who is Messiah and Lord Jesus is the one who rescues humanity from sin and delivers humanity from condemnation of alienation or alienation from God and he brings universal salvation peace and goodwill so Again, both of these uh, infancy narratives, if you will, very different theological constructs in order to get across their particular theology. Now, there's something else to this too, which maybe could be a little unsettling. When the sacred authors put together these infancy narratives, <coughs> they didn't just invent them out of whole cloth. There was a lot of traditions uh, that already uh, were circulating um, that both of them shared in common. But what they did is they constructed these narratives according to what a literary tool that was used at the time called uh, uh, announcement of birth formula, um, the denunciation of birth formula. For instance, when somebody who was very important was born in ancient antiquity, they always would look to the, the birth and say, well, this person must have been, there must have been something special about his birth. And so there was a literary tool that circulated at the time that they would fit these important people into. For instance, Matthew and John the Baptist. Uh, and Matthew, excuse me. Samson. Remember Samson and Delilah? Yeah. Right. Well, this birth formula, and let me make sure I get it right, there was always an appearance of an angel which was followed by a reaction of fear by a recipient. Then there was an announcement made by an angel. There was then an objection by the recipient. And then there was a giving of a sign of reassurance. Now, that kind of formula 
existed. And then what they would do is they would fit their theological perspective into that formula when they presented it in the scriptures. Now, if you look at the birth of Sam Samson, it, it, it does just that. And if you look at the birth of John the Baptist, same thing. The angel comes, comes to Zechariah. In Gospels, it comes to who? Uh, you sure? Joseph. If we didn't have Luke's Gospel, Mary would be pretty much out of the picture. We, who did the who did the angel appear to in the gospel reading this weekend, past weekend? Joseph. 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 Why? Joseph in the tradition, the uh, original Joseph in the Old Testament, he was the great interpreter of gene, uh, dreams. Huh? Guess what Joseph is in the New Testament? The great interpreter of dreams. He comes to Joseph in a dream. Take this woman as your wife. And he took her into his home. Take this woman and flee. Someone is, wants to kill him. Those comes to him again. Take the family and go back. Those who wanted his life are now gone. So Joseph is very much in line with the Joseph of the Old Testament. Mary doesn't get the Annunciation. He does. So, again, very Jewish context. Makes sense to the Jewish people. Makes maybe a little less sense to us. So anyhow, that Annunciation of Birth formula was used to present a, a way of presenting a birth of someone who was seen to be very, very important. And it was used in Samson, it was used in John the Baptist, it was used in secular Roman society. If you look at Caesars, um, you look at uh, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and you look at the secular writings, an angel, a miraculous kind of birth. He's a God. You know, all of that is there. So when we get to Jesus, we do the same thing. The, the sacred authors use that same style of writing to present the birth of Jesus. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am not saying here that there's nothing about Jesus' birth that isn't historical. There's obviously a lot. And, the, you know, that Jesus uh, was born of a virgin, that Jesus um, was the Messiah, the Son of God, that he was born to save his people, um, that somehow there was a miraculous birth in um, part of that. That's all we believe and that's all true, um, in so much that we can say that when we look at the similarities of these two birth announcements, those are the things that overlap that came down through tradition as being true. So we can separate out that which are similar and then we look at the other stuff which is different and can conclude that the different stories reflect the author's theology of, of who he thinks Jesus is. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, time's up. Let's go. <laughs> Sure. Can you talk about that miraculous birth? Oh, it's a mystery. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. In such a way, in what way? Um, <clears throat> only because I teach eighth grade theology, so that came up as, you know, the virgin birth, the miraculous birth, and the kids were saying, do you mean that Jesus was like, Mary was pregnant, and then Jesus had a baby? I mean, and then Jesus was born, and... She didn't really deliver the baby, but Jesus was just up here. That's how they understand. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the whole virgin birth is uh, it's kind of muddy waters. Like, but they quote Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, I think it's chapter 7, 22. Um, and she and the virgin shall bear a son. Um, however, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek. If you actually look at the actual Hebrew word, um, which I, I can't recall it off here, um, the actual Hebrew word for virgin is not virgin. It was born of a woman. Um, when the Hebrew translated into, the Septuagint was translated into Greek, um, they did not have a corresponding word 
for the Hebrew word, the closest they had was virgin. And that's how we ended up with it in the New Testament. Translation is a messy process. When you translate, when we talk about the New American Bible, the reason we use the New American Bible is because it's a translation where um, the Old Testament was translated directly from the Hebrew, the New Testament from the Greek. But it's never one for one. There's many words in one language that there's no corresponding words in the next. And so you have to use best guess. And that's what the sacred office and interpreters had to use with best guess. And so when they translated that word that was used in Isaiah 72 into Greek, the, the closest they could come to was virgin. And, and that's where some of our Jewish people will, will have take us, take us on and say, hey, sorry, you know, you read into it that it's not there in the Old Testament. And it's not for all intents and purposes. So, but that's not, you don't want to go there with your kids. Um, <laughs> as to where are the birds and bees and how, <laughs> good luck. I, I don't know. That's hard. Yeah. I don't know if, if anyone else has got anything they like that. I don't know. Um, okay, we talked a little bit about the genealogy. Um, as I said, in Matthew's Gospel, Joseph is the main character. Mary is not. We, I don't even think we would know Mary's name if we didn't have Luke. In Luke's Gospel, Mary is the main person and Joseph is not. Why? In jo Matthew's Gospel, who play the leading roles in society? Okay. Go Matthew. No. <laughs> <laughs> But obviously that that perspective is not important in Luke. And so Mary plays the prominent role in Luke's gospel. Um, we talked about uh, the birth. Um, just other little things that uh, are different. Uh, in which version do we have the Magi show up? Mark. No, Mark doesn't have an infancy narrative. <coughs> Just a Matthew. Just a Matthew. Who shows up in Luke's Gospel? The shepherds. Now, God loves St. Francis of Assisi. Did a lot for the church. But he also created a problem. When he started to put the, the crush together, what do we get? Usually we get a harmonization, and you'll see it in ours upstairs when we do it too. You'll find the Magi right in there with the shepherds, and, you know, and so what we get is a harmony of, of two narratives being put together, and we can come away with thinking that's, you know, that's what it is, but it's really two different things. But, okay. Um, similarities between Matthew and Luke. Uh, the parents of Jesus are both Joseph and Mary. The conception of Jesus by Mary through the Holy Spirit, that's the same. Um, there's a directive from an angel to name the child Jesus in both. The angel states that Jesus is to be Savior in both. We said the birth of Jesus is in Bethlehem. Um, the birth is chronologically related to King Herod. And Jesus returns to Nazareth. So those are the similarities. Everything else is different because it, re it reflects, like I said, different theological underpinnings. Alrighty, I think, uh, where were we? Wow. Well, a little bit after eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have to put this back together now. <laughs> yeah, now we've got to put this all together. Um, I just want to make sure I've got everything that I wanted to cover. So, yeah. So where does that leave us? Share with me your thoughts and feelings so far. <coughs> don't be, <coughs> don't be shy. I, I just, I guess, I have more of a question than a feeling. Um, with so many similarities in the birth story, how did we, as Catholics, over the centuries, 
decide on the tradition of the manger, where in some Gospels there was no manger. Well, like I said that the manger it was a, a an invention, if you will, of um, uh, Francis of Assisi, yeah, and um, yeah, it was his way of. Um, uh, well, and let me let me back up to how did we choose one over the other? He didn't. As a matter of fact, prior to 1943, when it came to literal interpretations of the scriptures, um, we were probably, as Catholics, preeminent. Um, and therefore, we had no problem blending these different traditions together. Uh, it wasn't until after uh, the encyclical by uh, Pope Pius XII, Unitatis Redentigratio, I think it is, which, um, really thrusted the Catholic Church into the 20th century on biblical interpretation as to the point of um, now embracing all of the sciences and, and everything and bringing that all to bear on scripture interpretation that the literal interpretation is, um, is deficient in many ways and, um, but because of that we could harmonize both accounts and come up with things like the creche and, and other things as well. Yeah. I mean, in early, it, it, you know, probably even before our time, we weren't encouraged to read the scriptures. Yeah. Now, I had the chance to go to, to Bethlehem, and you know, they have the, the spot that, that Jesus was, you know, you go in the door of humility, and then you go down to the, mm -hmm. to the crypt there, and you can kind of touch the spot, and there's, there's spots all over Jerusalem, all over <laughs> everywhere that says, you know, this is the spot that you know, the angel appeared to Joseph that, um, and all sorts of things happen. And according to their tradition, which I found interesting, there are a few, uh, like the Ar Armenians and the Catholics might have, like, the same type of spot, just in two different, completely different spaces. So this is where they believe it happened, this is where, where the Romans would believe it happened. Um, for, at Bethlehem, though, there was just the, the Church of the Nativity, you know, and, and, um, and it's, it's really, really, it's, it's it's beautiful, you know, and um, there has to be something that led people to a, a, a certain spot in tradition building over time, you know, and yeah. the, the sacred 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 uh, land. Of course, we're in 2016, and um, you know, we but those 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 special places have been um, protected for a long time. You wonder what the whole history is behind that. Oh yeah, you know, of how that all began, and did somebody just you know, walk and say, well, Bethlehem, so it must, it might have been somewhere around here, so let's just say Jesus is, was actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating you know, in to some think way about. that happened. It, it really, it, Emperor Constantine's mother mm -hmm. was um, commissioned by him after Christianity was made a state religion and really brought out of the catechumes and, and, and uh, lifted up for what it was. Um, he sent her back and um, to identify spots, mm -hmm. uh, which she did. But, um, and again, how, this is 300 years later. We, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, so you, there's a certain amount of skepticism. I know the Via Della Rosa, if you talk to uh, Jerome Murphy O'Connor, um, one of the most foremost, foremost uh, scripture scholars on, on Bethlehem and so forth, he'll tell you it's a completely different place than where traditional Mm -hmm. yeah, well, because the Via de Dolorosa Rosa is where the way of the cross the is, the cross. and uh, in, in Jerusalem, it's interesting, it's just all these side streets, and there's like shops and all sorts of yeah. stuff, and in, in, in part of Rome, going up a hill, yeah. and you can kind of, you can kind of envision maybe it's something like that, we just think it's Calvary, we think it's like a mountain, but it could have been city streets that Jesus walked through, you know, and it's, um, again, putting all the stories and reading scripture and taking our tradition and what actually it was, I, I <laughs> Yeah. I don't think any of us know. No one you know. Deacon Lee, you mentioned in the beginning you explained how the sacred authors of the four Gospels were not the namesakes of the Gospels. Why did they <coughs> pick the particular names that they did? I, I mean, at your They were prominent early Christian figures. Mm. Prominent people that the early church knew. Okay. And so there, there may have been so some... So it was an identification factor. They... The, people of the church at that time knew about Mark or they knew about Luke or they knew about John right. and Matthew and so they chose 
to attribute the Gospels to those names Correct. based on their connection with the people, whether they were Gentile or Jewish. Right. And okay. the Gospels, especially like if you read the Gospel of Luke, the Gospels for the most part were probably second generation Christian authors. <clears throat> Possibly third, but most likely second. Because you can read the Gospel of Luke. He said, "You know, many before me have attempted to to put together this narrative, and you know he's building on traditions of many people already have trying to do this, and so forth, and, so, and he's collecting stories. And remember too, um, most of the people were illiterate. They didn't read. You know, um, we hold scripture to be sacred, huh?" Mm -hmm. Obviously. But we also hold oral tradition to be sacred. The scriptures were written by the Catholic Church. I don't care what anybody tells you. The Catholic Church wrote the New Testament. And that New Testament was born out of oral tradition. And oral tradition is just as sacred as scripture in and of itself. So many traditions that we will have, for instance, some of the venerations of Mary and so forth, you can't find in the scriptures. Yeah. But you know that they're firmly rooted within oral tradition. And that the scriptures were born out of that tradition. And so people talking around campfires and sharing stories about this Jesus that they heard about. I mean, it's all through that that people kind of put all this together. That's why we have the Stations of the Cross. They came because people couldn't read. So, but they could follow some lines. That's why we have stained glass windows. They were even evangelizing tools. They told the story of Jesus to people who couldn't read. You know? You, you said earlier that um, Matthew and Luke had different theologies. I, I think by what you mean that, that they understood Jesus to be different. or to, that they, t they would have answered the question, who was Jesus differently? Could you expand a little more on that and how, how their theologies differed? Matthew, it, yeah, okay. It would be like, and I wish I had the sheet with me. Um, I did this with the class. It would be like taking John F. Kennedy. And if you asked an African-American community to present to you what importance JFK played in their life, they might talk civil rights, huh? Um, things along that nature that lifted up the immigrants. And then if you talk to someone who was on Wall Street, well, the importance for JFK might have been someone who was well-cultured. Family had a lot of money. Or if you talk to someone, a blue collar, um, he developed the Peace Corps. He was for the average worker. All of those different perspectives of people had their importance that they placed on him was in reflection of what he did for that group of people. And so that's what the gospel writers did. For Luke's gospel, for instance, Luke, um, he was hired by a, a very wealthy um, bureaucrat, uh, a, benef um, a benevolent guy, um, hired to write a gospel uh, about Jesus. And one of the main points in Jesus's in that Luke's gospel is that Jesus is the is the Messiah of the poor, of the marginalized, of those who have very little. Why? Because a good part of his community was made up of people like that that were being marginalized, forgot about, um, and so therefore in Luke's gospel you have the Beatitudes: Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Very real things, because he was facing that, and, and so they could identify. They had shepherds, and, not kings. And they had shepherds, not kings, exactly. <laughs> in Matthew's Gospel, he was, it's blessed in the poor in spirit. He's completely removed it from its original context and spiritualized them. But he had a different reason for doing it. And so you have to know what's going on in the community, the, in Matthew's, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is the most human that you'll find Jesus. In John's gospel, Jesus is the most divine. And Matthew and, and Luke, um, more emphasis, maybe a balance between the two. But again, they all had their own 
their own reasons for writing the way they did. I have a question. When you're talking about how they had different stories about telling the, the same truths, were they, were both of the stories based on some sort of tradition, a Catholic tradition, you believe, or not? The, a lot of that came out of oral tradition. Um, I don't. I can't say that the stories were based. It was. It was based on the, their culture and their kinds. They drew upon a lot of different things. No, I was just wondering, like when you said that they were writing them in whatever seventy or eighty A.D. Wouldn't there have been people who were, you know, kind of still living when some of that happened? And mm -hmm. based on that, were they able to put together a story based on what audience they were trying to, to reach? Yes. You know, those stories. Were there eyewitnesses alive when the Gospels were written? That's, that's, we don't know. Yeah. The average age is 40. First gospel is written 40 years after the death of Jesus. Could there be eyewitnesses still around? Sure. Um, and the gospel material based on those eyewitnesses' accounts? Absolutely. To what degree? They don't know. But the likelihood is that most of the eyewitnesses were probably gone by the time the first gospels were written. It was still, the second generation Christian. But the right? stories and the tradition and the, 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 the and oral tradition yeah. stays. That was, yeah. that was kind of my question. Mm -hmm. is that, you know, they may not have been alive, but the stories, the stories are passed on. came from tradition passed on from people who were there. Oh, yeah, especially the oh, Jesus yeah. stories. Oh, yeah, the yeah. healings and all that. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 But the, the birth of Jesus was not emphasized, you said. Not in the beginning. Not initially. Not initially. It wasn't important to them at the time. Well, you have to think of that, too, as like eyewitnesses of that and then not hearing about Jesus for 30 years. You know, it, there I mean, were no it, eyewitnesses of the birth mm -hmm. of Jesus. Because Jesus really came on the scene with his public ministry. Those stories mm -hmm. came to be passed on <coughs> later. Yeah. You know, when they constructed the Gospels, as I said, the Mark was first, Matthew and Luke used Mark. But Matthew uh, and Luke also had another source available to them, which we can only reconstruct through, through looking at the scriptures. It's called Q. Q is a German word for quell. Yeah. Um, and in this source, there was other stories and sayings that Jesus had. And why do we know it exists? Because we can look at Matthew and Luke, who one Luke wrote in... Um, uh, excuse me, Matthew, Matthew wrote in Antioch, uh, excuse me, Damascus in Syria. Luke went all the way down to southern Greece. So hundreds of miles, they didn't know each other was writing, and yet they shared material between them that was not found in Mark. So they must have had some source available to them that they drew on, which we postulate is called Q, a German well for quell, which means source. And in that may have been infancy narrative material. Mark definitely had a, a miracle source. Mark and John, you'll find that the miracles in there are almost sequential. And both of them, the miracles, constitutes the first half of their Gospels uh, for the most part. And so there's a miracle source that circulated that we don't have a copy of but that John and Mark probably did and, and uh, incorporated in their Gospels. Yeah. So are you all thoroughly confused? <laughs> oh, great. This was very interesting. Any other thoughts or questions? I think it's interesting how sometimes, <clears throat> for those of us that have been cradle Catholics, over the years you're taught certain things <clears throat> and you don't fully realize the scope of all of the intricacies of Scripture. And I think one of the fears I have is that, gee, maybe I was believing the wrong thing once in a while. Maybe I didn't get, you know, the way it was intended. 
And yet, when you describe it or when you explain it the way you do, it makes sense. It just seems like there's, there's more reinforcement to what we've been taught all these years. There's, there's better understanding. There's better understanding. Um, if you want to delve any further into this, there's a wonderful book out. Uh, this is by Father Raymond Brown, a premier Catholic scholar who uh, unfortunately has since passed away. He taught at the seminary that I went to. That's our claim to fame. Yeah. St. Mary's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I attended many, uh, many programs that he offered, and um, he, he's just wonderful. I mean, this is just all on the infancy narratives if you really want to go into yeah. all that. And, and this still just read it now, page one, chapter one. Just read exactly. it. Well, you can stay. Just read the book to us. <laughs> <laughs> page one, chapter one. Get more wine. <laughs> You could probably kick it up on the computer, or, you know. Um, so that can be found at Amazon or anything like that if you want to learn a little bit more. But, so that's all that I have for this evening. Um, thank you. Thank you.